All right, Santino, thanks for being able to talk with me today. I want to know, leading up to the race, how soon do you start looking at what the weather's going to be? Oh, man, I think we look at it every day. I mean, I kid you not, every morning we are watching the forecast or watching the barometric pressure, the humidity, uh, the temperature, how it's going to rise, you know, cloud cover. Everything has an effect on the cars to the point that you're trimming the car for the weather. It's, it's a huge deal for us. I mean, we... When I mean we watch it nonstop, I mean, we literally watch it nonstop. We try to do your job for you, kind of in a sense. It's how, that's how much we're on top of it. Wow. I mean, how much can you really, obviously, you're looking at all this data, you're looking at the forecast. Can you really plan and prepare? How much are you able to prepare for? And how much do you have to, on the day of, in the moment of, react? What's the balance? I mean, you're kind of reacting right up to the race uh, every day. You know, the difference for us, I mean, say the temperature decides to rise from 85 degrees to 95 degrees uh, in the span of 35, 40 minutes when the sun comes out, our cars will lose about 100 pounds of downforce, give or take, which is about five miles an hour. So it fluctuates a lot. And when you're on race day, you know, we've had some pretty hot race days the last couple of years. And we're just trying to pay attention to what the maximum temperature is going to be in the race and try and get the car set for a specific downforce level at that point in time. Because if the, the higher the temperature, the higher the humidity, the slower the cars are going to go and the less downforce we're going to have. So we need to put more wing angle to uh, get a little bit more grip. If you had to pick an ideal weather forecast for Indy 500, what would you pick? I, a lot of drivers are going to hate this. I'd love to see a 105 degree day with uh, a big wind, a big headwind uh, coming from uh, the south to the north, which would mean a tailwind coming out of turn two, because it just makes it super tricky. Uh, it makes passing out of turn four down to turn one really, really important. And um, yeah, I just like the idea of a, a hot, greasy track just because it, it loosens, it frees up the cars. It makes it a little bit more driver challenging uh, in a sense. As uh, Unlike the test we just had in April, I mean, it got up to maybe 80 during the, the day at the hottest point in, on our Thursday test. And, you know, even then at 80 degrees, the cars are glued to the racetrack. So when you're testing at 60, 65, I mean, you can drive wherever you want. It's it's amazing. So there's just so much confidence. So I kind of wouldn't mind having that stripped. <laughs> it just it puts it a little bit more in the hands of the driver. It creates for better racing. Uh, you see a little bit more too wide action. So because the cars will have a lot more wing in them, and you know it'll bring us a little closer together. So I'm gathering from that you like the unpredictability that that change in weather would bring. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that and I also like racing in the heat, you know, for the fatigue reasons. I, you know, I, we train quite a bit, so it'll catch some of the drivers off guard if they're not really ready to sit inside a, a hot car. Because at a 100, 100 degree day in our cars, it'll bring the temperature in the cars up to about 130. And then we have to sit in that for about three hours, give or take, with limited water, limited air. And if you're not, if you're not trained for that correctly, it's very hard. So we, you know, I, I like the challenge. Now, how do you train to endure that heat? Cause I'm sure you go through some hot races and, and hot experiences that are different than, you know, what the weather is most likely to be in Indianapolis in late May. How do you prepare for that type of heat? So, you know, I've started doing some cardio. I actually ran a half marathon just, to say that I could, I know that the Indy one, uh, is on this or was on the seventh was I think Indy did a, a mini marathon as well. Um, you know, training with cardio with like a raincoat, you know, or a jacket to make your body internal body temperature just really rise was something that I did a lot of, and I just enjoy it. I also don't, for me being small, uh, I'm on the smaller side of drivers. I don't sweat a lot and I also don't lose a lot of water weight. So I'm very fortunate to be able to just bake, <laughs> bake in the sun and re really have minimal fatigue. You know, unlike when you have a big driver per se, Graham, you know, Graham's got almost 80 pounds on me 
and his water weight fluctuates a lot more than per se mine would. So for him, he, you know, he's a big dude. He's put in a tiny car. He's going to sweat a lot and he's in great shape and he has to be because of his size for me, you know, I can be in great shape and go sit in the car and get out and look like I just sat in my simulator for two hours. Can you tell me like how when we talk about start with just the temperature what is that doing to the the car i mean how is it affecting things like the tires the the structure what are the impacts there so for the car wise uh you can you can start with the tires so when we talk about we we have two temperatures that we follow we follow the ambient so your typical air temperature and then track temperature so when you have a 95 98 degree day your track temperature is about 30 degrees higher because the asphalt's black heats up and the sun absorbs heat and what happens with the tires is the tires wear out a lot faster so firestone works really hard to come with a good compound that won't you know so the tires don't fall apart in that temperature but when it gets colder those tires are harder they last longer you know and they're very good so you'll see on a warm day a lot of tire deg you'll see a discrepancy uh, from the start of a run, you know, on our own, we could probably run 224 average lap speed. And at the end of the run in, in a hot day, it'll be about 215. So, you know, you'll lose an average of 10 miles an hour a lap over a 33 lap stint. Um, on top of that, with the heat, the engines can't make as much performance. You know, they are turbocharged, so they do heat soak. Um, and by heat soak, everything inside the car gets really hot and they just can't perform at their maximum. So their, their peak maximum. So they're still making about 700 horsepower, but when you lose about 15 horsepower to heat soak, it's a big deal. So especially for us. And then your suspension components get hot, things can fail in the heat. Uh, but for the most part, your, your two biggest factors, uh, when it's that hot for wear will be uh, the motor and the tires. And how does humidity factor into all this? So it's like air density. So if you think the thicker the air, you know, it's harder for the car to go through. So it creates more drag, it'll slow us down. So when we have, I think everyone can relate to this, when you have that fresh spring morning with that really crisp breeze and it's really nice, our cars are so fast in that air condition or in that, that type of air, just because it's no drag. So we can get all the benefits of the downforce without carrying that like parachute of drag uh, down the straight. So when we get a really humid day, when you walk outside and feel like you're about to take a shower, the car, it feels like it has a parachute on it. So it's just, it changes so much uh, just depending on, you know, the difference between 75% humidity and 85% humidity, we can lose almost five miles an hour. Wow. That's incredible. I would not think that just that 10% difference in humidity would have that sort of impact. Yeah, it's it's insane. When I mean we watch the weather religiously, I'm not kidding. It, we have our own separate charts that plot the weather. We have it predicted, kind of like how you guys do for everybody uh, that's watching at home. We have it predicted throughout the day based on your guys' forecast and your readings to predict what we're going to do with the car throughout the day. So it's it's a whole, it's a whole different uh, animal. Do you have a meteorologist on the team? Who's it, who's in charge of looking at and monitoring this? Is it somebody's specific role? We have uh, specific engineers. Uh, we have what's called a DAG engineer, and he's our data guy. Uh, each car will have one, and normally that's their job is on top of electronics is they're watching the weather to help predict and program to let the race engineer know. What we're doing with the weather is we're adjusting the car. Uh, say say the weather is kind of slowly getting hotter. What we're doing is we're gonna chase it with the car and slowly put in more downforce. We, we wanna keep the car and the weather on the same playing field so it's equal. So if it's 60 degrees, we have the car at the same amount of downforce calculated at 200 miles an hour as to when it is at 80 degrees. Because if you don't adjust the car for a 60 degree downforce, uh, you're gonna miss about hundred pounds of downforce, which in return is almost the difference between qualifying trim and race trim. So it's the cars will get very loose and very out of control quickly if you're not paying attention to the weather and adjusting for it. 
for which trim you're in. And how is all this information being communicated to you? And how are you, are you reacting and making all these changes while you're driving? Tell me about that. So I don't do a lot of the changes myself. I just, I like to learn. So I'm paying attention as to what the engineers are doing. When we're out doing a specific set of runs, you know, front wing testing or uh, suspension testing, normally what you'll see during practice is you'll see people go out for two hours and then they'll come back and then they'll reset, they'll adjust for the weather and then they'll go back out again. So, you know, you don't want to sit out on pit lane all day because you want to be able to bring the car back, set it down, make sure everything's recalculated back to baseline zero, recheck the weather, adjust the car for the weather. So you're at the same or similar baseline as when you were earlier in the day and then go back out. So it's it's a consistent changing variable. It's, it's honestly probably one of the uh, more unique things that we track uh, in a race team. It's only important in Indy too, which is kind of funny. And why do you think that is? The road course cars, you know, we're always running the same amount of downforce. We're always almost on the limit. Uh, in Indy, you know, a degree of wing angle, which is a degree of angle is nothing, is huge for us. I mean, it's the difference between uh, having a super loose car that feels like you're going to hit the wall to having a car that just won't turn. So we ha have to watch it to make sure that we're staying on top of our downforce levels our balance levels, you know, it's, it's incredible how much the weather has an effect. It's kind of annoying, you know, in a sense, but it's part of the game. So if we're actually in the, it's, it's race day, you are racing. Are you kind of taking everything that you've learned in the testing up to the day and the expected forecast and the car is set in that way? Or are there still changes being made like halfway through the race if the weather conditions change? How do you adapt during the race itself? So we'll pay attention to cloud cover. Say that it, you know we start the race and it's really sunny because we've had some races uh, that have started out where it's just boiling. And then you, get a, you know you're gonna get a bunch of cloud cover at the end of the day. What we'll do is we'll prepare to trim the cars. So we'll set the cars on the grid uh, pre-race with a little bit more front and rear wing angle to have a little bit more downforce. And then if it gets cloudy or per se, or say you're running out front uh, in the top five, what we'll do is we'll, we'll trim out. So we'll lower the wing angle to get more top speed out of the cars. And especially, uh, you know, the leaders will probably do it regardless, just because it's really hard to uh, win Indy with a lot of downforce because you are a little bit easier to be passed, but especially if it gets cloudy or we know it's going to cool off, you know, we want the cars to go faster because we're going to have more natural grip in that cooler, uh, cooler climate. Have you had an experience specifically um, where weather has had an impact in your race, good <laughs> or bad? I think everybody's had that one specific incident. Um, I feel like this happens every year is when it gets gusty, uh, cause it does get gusty. There's a break in the, in the grandstands between, uh, turn in turn two. And we've had a couple of years where we've had a couple gusts of wind and the car just gets super loose and it's just terrifying. And you know, it happens to everybody because all of a sudden everybody goes into turn two on the brakes because they're all afraid because they went through the lap before and they had a massive moment. So there's always a point in time in the race where the wind picks up or it pushes a car one direction. It, it, it's just bound to happen. We have the, um, we have like the wind tunnel tubes uh, that show the air direction uh, at the top of the pagoda. And a lot of drivers, including myself, I watch them just to make sure because the wind direction for three hours isn't going to stay the same. It's always going to change a little bit. So you're always trying to pay attention to which direction the wind is because it'll tell you how hard you can drive in certain corners. You know, if you have that tailwind coming out of two and a tailwind down the back stretch, you know, you know that you have to take it easier going into two because if you are pushing too much and you come through two with too much angle and you catch a gust of wind in the tail of the car, uh, you're going to spin. So, and vice versa, if the wind stays going from north to south and you're getting a headwind coming out of two, you know that you can really drive it into the corner and you know that the car is going to stick coming out. 
So it just changes how you're going to pass where you're going to pass. Uh, and it does fluctuate through the race for the most part. What is it like when you are driving in an Indy, Indy car and it is windy? Because you know, I tell my viewers when it's going to be a windy day, hey, we have wind gusts 40, 50 miles an hour. It's going to be hard if you're driving a truck or a van or you're just a regular you know, vehicle. But when you're traveling at those speeds and you're encountering winds, um, how is it to control your vehicle? What speeds, how, how high does the wind have to be for you to start to get concerned or to feel the impacts in your car? So unlike the, so the Indy car, I would say to like a normal vehicle or even a stock car, for example, when you get gusts of wind, because the cars are like uh, stock cars and road cars are like bubbles, you feel them blow the cars around. Since our cars are like little planes, it takes a lot of wind. And what happens when it gets super windy is we have this thing called buffering. And in the test, at the end of the test on Thursday, it got really windy. And, the, and to give you an example of the buffering, my helmet was shaking inside the car and lifting and my seat belts were vibrating. Oh. Like my, I, we wear our belts as tight as we can get them. So to have them sit there and vibrate off your chest it's not a pleasant feeling. So that's kind of what we get. Uh, you'll feel the wind uh, also when you're in the train of cars going in a line. And if you pull out and it's windy, it feels like someone, you, it feels like you hit the brakes. You just lose all momentum, especially if you're in a headwind, the car just instantly dies. It's just the strangest thing uh, racing in it, but you don't, it doesn't really move the car as much as you would think. It, it just, it does, weird things like that you know you just you feel it you hear it you know the pressure inside the cockpit goes up massively so you just like your body feels it more than you feel it driving so it's kind of a it's a different sensation wow that's that's interesting that's really yeah interesting. they don't make it they don't make it easy now you talked earlier on in the interview you didn't mention that you guys monitored barometric pressure mm -hmm. how does that impact things for you so that's more for, I'd say, our drag reduction. You know, we just have to pay attention to make sure it doesn't, it, it normally stays pretty consistent in May, but if you have a big fluctuation, you do have to pay attention because you'll lose downforce real quickly. Um, you can also gain it really quickly and you don't have to do anything. I mean, that's the beauty of it. If you get a qualifying day, say we roll out qualifying day and we get a, you know, if we don't have a 90 degree day like we've had in the past, say we have a day that it's like 65, you know, we're going to be well over 240 miles an hour before we enter turn one. I mean, you can see some incredibly high speeds, uh, especially if it's cool, you know, it's crisp, you know, pressures are really stable and you can make a consistent car. You'll see some really great speeds. So I wish I would be really cool to see. It's really terrifying when you're going 240 plus, because there's a, there is a huge difference between doing 225, 230 and 240 especially for us. I mean, there, it feels like stuck, planted, confident to like ragged edge cars trying to take you down every corner. So I'm, I'm personally wouldn't mind like a middle 80, middle of the road, 85 ish degree day to have some downforce in the car to feel comfortable. But, you know, I have this funny feeling that we might have a couple of cool days uh, this year. Cause you know, you can't, you can't just keep having hot days. Eventually it's got to flip. So uh, it'd, be, it'd be fun to see what the cars can really do at that, at that temperature and at that speed. Now, this is going to be what number Indy 500 for you? Number four. Number four. So what are, what are your emotions now as we sit here with the days counting down? Oh, man, we met on my first one in 19. So now we're four years down the road. I am just as excited to be getting there. I'm even more excited this year than I am my first year. Just because it's our first, it's our first year back. In, in nineteen, it was tough because everything was so overwhelming for me. It's such a new experience. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Now that we're coming back, we're full fans. We're everybody's going to be there. It's going to be a fantastic time. I'm super excited because I know what this race is like. Uh, you know, I'm just we just want a consistent weekend, and that's you know that's what I'm going to hope for. We knock on wood, we were really great in the test. We were very consistent, no, no little hiccups. You know, we were able to get a lot, a lot of learning done. You know, if we had the same type of progression throughout the month of May, we're gonna be great. 
All right. Well, you know, I think we've covered all the questions I had on my list. Is there anything else that you'd like to add in? Oh, man, I hope people come out. It's going to be this year is going to be insane. I, I think uh, the amount of hype around the race that people are excited to come back. I think this is going to be one of the biggest races that uh, we've seen in a while at Indy. I think you're right. And, I, you know, I really appreciate your time uh, and explaining all this to us. It was just fascinating. I know our weather watchers are going to really enjoy it. Uh, you are a top-notch guy when you came to visit us in your rookie year at uh, Wayne Studios. So uh, I was glad to reach out to you and glad you were able to share your insight with us. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Nick. This has hey, been great. Hey, no problem. Thank you so much. Good luck. All right. Take care, buddy. Thanks. You too.